سلطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فضربنا على نحن نقص عليك نبأهم بالحق نحن نقص عليك نبأهم إنهم فتية آمنوا بربهم وزدناهم هدى وربطنا لقد قلنا إذا شططا لولا يأتون عليهم بسلطان بين فمن أظلم من من افترى على الله كذبا صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد صلوا على محمد وآل محمد
مرة ثانية على حب الزهراء أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أفتتح الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للصواب بمنك وأيقنت أنك أنت أرحم الراحمين في موضع العفو والرحمة وأشد المعاقبين في موضع النكال والنقمة وأعظم المتجبرين في موضع الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أذنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمع يا سميع مدحتي وأجب يا رحيم دعوتي وأقل يا غفور عثرته فكم يا إلهي من قربة قد فرجتها وهموم قد كشفتها وعثرة قد أقلتها ورحمة قد نشرتها وحل خطيب لا إن قد فككتها الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله الفاشي في الخلق أمره وحمده الظاهر بالكرم مجده الباسط بالجود يده الذي لا تنقص خزائنه ولا تزيده كثرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوهاب اللهم إني أسألك قليلا من كثير مع حاجتي بي إليه عظيما وغناك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصفحك عن ظلمي وسترك على قبيح عملي وحلمك عن كثير جرمي عندما كان من خطي وعمدي أطمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت أدعوك آمنا وأسألك مستانسا 
لا خائفا ولا وجلا مضلا عليك فيما قصدت فيه إليك فإن أبطأ عني عتبت بجهلي عليك ولعل الذي أبطأ عني هو خير لي لعلمك بعاقبة الأمور فلم أر مولا كريما أصبر على عبد لئيم منك علي يا رب إنك تدعوني فأولي عنك وتتحبب إلي فأتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي التطول عليك فلم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل علي بجودك وكرمك فرحام عبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخي الرياح فالك الإسباح ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الريس فالك الإسباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له منازع يعادل ولا شبيه يشاكل ولا ظهير يعاضد قهر بعزته الأعزاء وتواضع لعظمته العظماء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أنادي ويستر علي كل عورة وأنا أعصي ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازي فكم من موهبة هنيئة قد أعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبهجة مونقة قد أراني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي يهتك حجابه ولا يغلق بابه ولا يرد سائله ولا يخيب آمله الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويضع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نقال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين 
الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وعمارها وتموج البحار من يسبح في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزاك ويتعم ولا يتعام ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيارتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأحسن وأجمل وأكمل وأسكى وأنما وأطيب وأطهر وأسنى وأكثر ما صليت وباركت وترحمت وتحننت وسلمت على أحد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وصفوتك وأهل الكرامة كرامة عليك من خلقك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين وصي رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدتي نساء العالمين وصل على سبتي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وصل على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي حججك على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائما اللهم وصل على ولي أمرك القائم المؤمل والعدل المنتظر وحفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيده بروح القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعله الداعي إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلفه في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبله مكن له دينه الذي ارتضيته لا أبدله من بعد خوفه أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم أعزه وأعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتحا يسيرا واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا اللهم أظهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخالق اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهلا وتدل بها النفاق وأهلا 
وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فحملنا وما كسرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم المن به شعثنا واشعب به صدعنا وارتك به فتقنا وكثر به قلتنا وأعزز به غلتنا وأغني به عائلنا واقضي به عن مغرمنا واجبر به فقرنا وصد به خلتنا ويسر به عسرنا وبيض به وجوهنا وفك به أسرنا وأنجح به طلبتنا وأنجز به مواعيدنا واستجب به دعوتنا واعطنا به سؤلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا واعطنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وأوسع المعطين اشفي به صدورنا وأذهب به غيظ قلوبنا واهدنا به لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنك إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وانصرنا به على عدوك وعدونا إله الحق آمين اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا وكلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتظاهر الزمان علينا فصل على محمد وآله وعنا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجل وبذر تكشف ونصر تعز وسلطان حق تظهر ورحمة منك تجللناها وعافية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم برحمتك في الصالحين فأدخلنا وفي علينا فارفعنا وبكأس من معين من عين سلسبيل فاسقنا ومن الحور العين برحمتك فزوجنا ومن الولدان المخلدين كأنهم لؤلؤ مكنون فأخدمنا ومن طمار الجنة ولحوم الطير فأطعمنا ومن طياب الصندس والحرير والاستبرق فألبسنا وليلة القدر وحج بيتك الحرام وقتلا في سبيلك فوفق لنا وصالح الدعاء والمسألة فاستجب لنا وإذا جمعت الأولين والآخرين يوم القيامة فارحمنا وبراءة من النار فاكتب لنا وفي جهنم فلا تغلنا وفي عذابك وهوانك فلا تبتلنا ومن ومن الزكوم والضريع فلا تتعمنا ومع ومع الشياطين فلا تجعلنا وفي النار على وجوهنا فلا تكبمنا ومن طياب النار وسرابيل القطران فلا تلبسنا ومن كل سوء يا لا إله إلا أنت بحق لا بحق لا إله إلا أنت فنجنا 
صلوا على محمد وال محمد Sent Brother Mahdi. I'm sure he did not get his good voice from his dad, this for sure. <laughs> Salaamu Alaikum, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the fifth night of uh, our program. Uh, once again, we ask Allah in this month to accept our amal and to give us the strength to uh, do more salat, do more dua, salat al layl. And of course, the strength to keep coming to these places. Uh, these majalis are very important. This majlis is a form of ibadah and worship by itself. So we thank you again for your support by coming. We thank you again for your support, us financially, to keep this place up and running. Um, one of the ways, as you know, to support us during the month of Ramadan is by sponsoring one of the nights. We still have a uh, few nights available to be sponsored on behalf of the souls of your marhumin and your family. So um, please sponsor one of these nights and get with Brother Hassan for more details. Uh, also a reminder that we are still selling tickets for our annual iftar that's coming up on April 5. Uh, if you did not get a ticket yet, please do so to come support us and have fun and have good food as well. Um, some other announcements we have today is, uh, one of them is um, the Eid Toy Drive. Uh, just a reminder that our youth have a Eid Toy Drive accepting new and unwrapped toys until March 27. There is a box right there that is still empty. I just checked it. We need to fill that box before 27th. Uh, all these toys would go, will be donated to children in need. Uh, also, we have the Quran competition. Uh, the details are on the WhatsApp group, on the flyer. Um, we would ask you to sign up and uh, memorize one of the three uh, surahs. Um, and that being said, I'm um, honored tonight to continue our... Um, um, I mean, I, I enjoy myself the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf with, with Shaykh Wa'il uh, Az-Zain. I'm so excited to hear the rest of the story. Uh, so please welcome Samahat Shaykh Wa'il Az-Zain with Allah Salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I request we recite Surah Al-Fatiha for a sick person, please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وأعز المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين العبد المؤيد والنور المسدد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فيقول الحق وقوله الصدق في محكم التنزيل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
واصبر نفسك مع الذين يدعون ربهم بالغداة والعشي يريدون وجهه ولا تعد عيناك عنهم تريد زينة الحياة الدنيا صدق الله العلي العظيم آمنا بالله ورسله to hasten the reappearance of our awaited Imam عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف I request we recite three salawat with the loudest of our voices Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. The verse that we started with tonight is verse number 28 in Surah Al Kahf. As many of you may know, that we've been dissecting the story of the companions of the cave in the previous nights, and then we shall continue. And then, inshallah, tomorrow shall be the final chapter of the story of the companions of the cave. This verse that I started with tonight is mentioned in verse number 28 in Surah Al Kahf. This verse comes exactly right after the last verse that talks about the story of the companions of the cave. When we look into this verse, there's a reason for the revelation of it. And the reason is, it happened after Rasulullah conquered Mecca. After the opening of Mecca, many people converted to the religion of Islam. And some of those people were referred to in the Islamic perspective as Al-Mu'allafati Qulubuhum meaning the ones whose hearts were reconciled simply because these people were considered from the nobles of Quraysh, they were from the aristocratic class of society, and they never really accepted Islam in the notion of Iman, but they converted to Islam simply because of the pressure and the fact that Islam became the dominant religion ruling over the Arabian Peninsula, such as, for example, Abu Sufyan, a person who never really accepted the religion of Islam to the point that when the Prophet ﷺ was entering Mecca with his army, he looked at Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, and then he looked at him and he said, لَقَدْ أَصْبَحَ مُلْكُ بْنُ عَمِّكَ عَظِيمًا or ibn أَخِيكَ عَظِيمًا meaning the kingship of your nephew has become great. And Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib looked back at Abu Sufyan and said to him, that this is not considered kingship. In fact, it is the apostlehood, it is the, the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there was an incident that occurred in the masjid during uh, the Prophet's presence. And that incident might appear to many of us as something insignificant to shed the light upon. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Quran paid very well attention to such incidents. What happened is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was sitting in the masjid surrounded by many of his companions. Some of these companions were known as Ashab al-Suffa, the ones that we spoke about in the previous nights, the ones who would live inside the masjid, and many of them, of them attained the level of scholarship. Such companions were surrounded by the Prophet ﷺ, were sitting around him and discussing matters of religion. And then a group of the nobles of Quraysh entered the masjid, and they approached the Prophet ﷺ while he was surrounded by such companions, companions such as Salman al-Farisi, such as Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, Khabbab ibn al-Art, or even Ammar ibn Yasir. Those were the companions who were absolutely devoted to the religion of Islam. They were absolutely devoted to ibadah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala complimented the Ashab al-Suffa in numerous verses in the Holy Quran as we spoke about within the previous nights. When they approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the nobles of Quraysh, many of them were obviously aristocratic. And then they approached the Prophet and they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, we would like to sit down and discuss with you certain matters. But people from our social class can never be equal to those people that are sitting around you. And therefore, if you were to just move aside and we can sit down with you and discuss such matters. The Prophet sallallahu became depressed on the spot as that he felt that these people are insulting his private companions. Those companions were very dear to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi and he would be so proud of them as many of them were total religious people that attained the level of scholarship. Therefore, on the spot, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. The verse in Surah the Cave, verse number 28, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladheena yad'oona rabbahum bil ghadati wal Addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam directly, saying, content yourself, acquire patience with those, with the company of those 
who supplicate their Lord morning and evening. Yuriduna wajha, desiring none but the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, Ya Rasulullah, is that content yourself, associate yourself with those who supplicate to their Lord, complimenting the companions who were sitting around them. Because they were companions who dedicated themselves to ibadah, to ilm, to jihad. And thereupon Allah said, content yourself with them. Because they supplicate to their Lord morning and evening, meaning their whole life is dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They implement religiosity in every step of their life. Yuriduna wajha, meaning the conclusion of their ibadah, their intention behind their ibadah is what? Nothing from this worldly desire. Yet, the only thing that they want is the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not want any reward in return except pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attaining the higher ranks in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not in the eyes of society. Yuriduna wajha wala ta'adu aynaka anhum turidu zinat al-hayat al-dunya. And do not lose sight of them, meaning stay with them. Do not let your sight exceed beyond them. Do not lose sight of them desiring the glitter of the life of this world. Why? Because those people who were considered the nobles of Quraysh, who came to approach the Prophet ﷺ to sit with him, yet the condition that they put is that they would not sit with the lower class of society. So Allah has said to the Prophet ﷺ, is that do not lose sight of those people. Stay with them. وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Desiring the glitter of this world. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that those aristocrats of Quraysh, they represent the glitter of this world. And how many of us sometimes are fascinated and deceived by the glitter of this world. And thereupon Allah said what? Do not let your sight, do not lose your, let your sight, uh, lose your sight of them. Desiring the glitter of this world, meaning, O Muhammad, sit down and associate yourself with those people that are considered your companions, even though they might be of the, of the class of poverty, meaning even though that they might be of the people that are considered the lower class of society, but you associate yourself with them. And that's the miraculous thing of the verse, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet وسلم, to be accompanied with such people and not the vice versa. And it's as if Allah is complimenting such people, raising them in ranks in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala evaluates human beings, is that the evaluation of a human being in the eyes of Allah is not their social status, is not their wealth, but it is their taqwa, their iman, their level of iman, their sincerity. Hence, you would notice that if there is anything that we can conclude, as a conclusion from the story of the people of the cave is what? Is literally this verse, because it came right after the last verse that speaks about the companions of the cave. Because if we were to reflect back on the story of the companions of the cave, as we mentioned in the previous nights, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not mention anything about their previous life, isn't it? You find that Allah began speaking about them simply when their journey began. Their journey began where? The government, government official was amongst them. The minister of the emperor was amongst them. The slave of the emperor, according to some narrations, was amongst them and even on their way they met with a shepherd and that shepherd believed in their message and he even accompanied them on the way so it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing an image in our minds saying that these people came all together under the banner of faith hence they are all equal in the eyes of Allah and you would notice that from the in the Quran in the holy Quran from the beginning to, to the end that there wasn't a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the story of a person or of a people except that he was always is concerned about their ending and not about their beginning. It's as if that Allah is telling us that, that it does not matter how a person begins, but it's how a person ends. And that's what is referred to in the Quran as what? As al-aqibah, meaning the conclusion, the outcome. The outcome of your life is what matters, not the beginning of your life. How many of us have began on the righteous path and then went astray? In fact, I would quote Ayatollah Bahjat in this regard, is that, that there is a time that will come on our ummah that a person might wake up a Husseini and end up Yazidi. 
and wake up a Yazidi and end up Husseini. And if there's anything that we learn from the battle of Karbala is what? How some people switch sides and thereupon one of the most crucial days in the times of the reappearance of our awaited Imam Ajallah Ta'ala Faraz Sharif is a day that is referred to as Yawmul Abdal, meaning what? Meaning the day of exchange. Focus on this please. You would notice that what will happen is that there will be a confrontation between Imam Al-Zaman and his nemesis as Sufyani. Imam Al-Zaman Al Faraj Sharif will speak about his movement, about his uprising, about his program. How will he rule over the earth? And in return, as Sufyani will do the same. There will be people in the camp of Imam Al-Zaman, believe it or not, that will switch sides and go join the army of as sufyani and there will be people in the army of as sufyani that would also switch sides and would join the camp of imam al-zaman simply because of their desires many people might listen to imam al-zaman and realize that the lifestyle that they will have to live under the ruling of imam al-zaman might be too tough on them to handle let me give you an example from history during the battle of Safin, when the war of Safin was occurring between Imam Ali alayhi salam and Muawiyah, there was an incident that happened that would totally enlighten our minds in this regard. There's a man by the name of Al-Harith al-Nahdi. Al-Harith al-Nahdi was considered one of the strongest allies of Imam Ali alayhi salam in the battle of Safin. Al-Harith al-Nahdi comes from Bani Nahd, a tribe that joined forces with Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam against Muawiyah in the war of Safin. What happened is that one time, the brother of Al-Harith al-Nadi, his brother, he was the chief of the tribe of Bani Nahd, a very powerful tribe in Kufa. And can you imagine at that point, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was in need of every single ally. When he joined the camp of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, one time his brother, who was also considered a poet of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he has poetry praising Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. When he, joined, uh, when he joined this camp, one time his brother, who was the poet, the brother of Al-Harith, was seen drunk in society. And then they brought him to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam applied on him the ruling. And then he lashed him. And then he put him in jail. His brother heard Al-Harith al-Nahdi, and then he came rushing to Imam Ali alayhi salam. When he came rushing to Imam Ali alayhi salam, he entered upon him angrily, looked at Imam Ali and he said, what is this that I've heard? He said, what? He said, I heard that you captured my brother and you lashed him, you punished him. He said, your brother is none but an individual in a Muslim society. He broke the law of Allah, hence we punished him so he may be purified. And that's the punishment, that's the adala, that's the justice. The man looked at Imam Ali alayhi salam, al Harith al-Nadi, and he said, Wallah, I shall leave you and go join Muawiyah. Could you imagine that? At that point, the Islamic Ummah was in such a crucial stage. And Imam Ali alayhi salam was in need of every single ally in his war against Muawiyah. Isn't it? You find that al Harith al-Nadi, Imam Ali alayhi salam, looked at him and he said, you know what? Do as you wish. Not even capture them. Why? Because there has to be the justice of Allah that has to be applied. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, and uh, uh, when it comes to the Islamic laws, he treated everybody equally. Isn't it? Al-Harith al-Nahdi went to Muawiyah. He entered upon Muawiyah. Muawiyah was told the news that Al-Harith al-Nahdi is coming to you. So Muawiyah prepared himself, a cunning person who knows exactly the game of politics. As soon as Al-Harith al-Nahdi entered to the court of Muawiyah, Muawiyah looked at him and he said, welcome to Al-Harith. A man who made a very simple mistake in Safin, but we forgave him for it. Al-Harith al-Nahdi at that point faced reality, and he admitted the truth about himself. He looked at Muawiyah and focused on those words. He looked at him and he said, Muawiyah, do not think that we ran away from the injustice of Ali ibn Abi Talib to your justice. But no, we ran away from the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib to your injustice. Meaning the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib is hard to handle. But your injustice is actually easy to handle. People sometimes have a hard time uh, uh, handling what? The justice of the religion of Islam. And that's what would happen in, during the times of Imam al-Zaman al-Sharif in that day that is called the day of exchange. You find that there will be people in the camp of Imam al-Zaman al-Sharif that would expose themselves at that point as being hypocrites. They could not handle the system of Imam al-Zaman. Hence, they will join what? The camp of us Sufyani, believe it or not. The same thing happened on the land of Karbala if there's anything that we could learn from it. Which is what? Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. You find that Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi made a decision. 
And on the spot, he left the camp of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and joined the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. It took him a moment of reflection. Could you imagine al hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi? Just reflect on his story, believe it or not. In a moment, few moments, al hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi transformed from what? When we recite in Ziyarat Ashura, Allahumma al-an qatalat al Hussein. Isn't it? He transformed from being Allahumma al-an qatalat al Hussein to what? As-salamu ala al Hussein. وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين. He turned just on the spot. He transformed. He took that step from لعنة may Allah forbid to what to السلام that al Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi is praised and complimented in the ziyara every time we recite the ziyarat Ashura or ziyarat Warith, isn't it? You find so therefore it's a matter of decision when it comes to this regard. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what? He tells us that under the eyes of Allah, the human being is always evaluated according to their what? To their taqwa and iman. And that's why Allah is always concerned about who ends. Why? You see, many human beings sometimes we tend to fluctuate on this earth. When we fluctuate a lot, then we get to a point where we need to make a decision. Each one of us gets to a point of crossroads in their life, and they need to make a decision. I remember personally an advice that I love to share that I, that I received from one of the scholars in Pakistan, Sayyid Alamdar Hussein. May Allah lengthen his life as he is still uh, alive. He's from the province of Punjab. In fact, he said to me one time the best advice. I remember the first year of Hawza, I called him through a friend of mine who knew him very well. And then I asked him for a piece of advice. He said, note that there are two types of people in this world that are absolutely happy. He said, the first type are the ones who are far away from Allah, Muhammad and al-Muhammad. Atheists, people that don't believe in the hereafter. Believe it or not, they're happy. Many of us know friends that are atheists. You come to them and you speak to them about the hereafter, they laugh at you, they joke. And what really amazes me sometimes is that Muslims that come and they're concerned about them. Oh, you know what? I have this atheist friend. They're too nice. And what does it mean? If you speak to them about the Quran, they laugh at you. They say, how is it that you believe in this? Right? So why are you worried about them when they're not worried about themselves? You're worried about their akhirah. And they're not worried about their own akhirah because they don't believe in akhirah. Believe it or not, such people are happy. Of course they are. You know why? Because they do not have any worry any action that they commit in this life, they're not worried that they're going to be judged for it and asked about it on the day of Qiyamah. So this is the first type. The second type are the extreme opposite. The ones that are extremely close to Allah, Muhammad and Al Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad. The ones that are extremely close to Allah, Muhammad and Al Muhammad, why? Because they could go through every single hardship in life and they would always be happy and content, simply because of their iman, just like those companions of Ahl al-Safa, that they were living in absolute poverty, homeless people that lived inside the masjid. Isn't it? Didn't we speak about that uh, in the previous nights? But they are absolutely happy. And then he said to me, he said, do you know who suffers? I said, who? He said, the ones that are in the middle. These are the ones who suffer. As long as you're in the middle, you'll always suffer. You will never put your head on the pillow and sleep comfortably. Simply because you're in the middle. One day you want to be religious, the other day you want to fulfill your desires. You tend to fluctuate. And people who fluctuate throughout history are the ones who were highlighted as the people who created the most amount of corruption in society. Let me give you an example, a final example. We'll end with this. Is that Shibith ibn Rabi? Shibith ibn Rabi, everybody knows Shibith ibn Rabi is one of the killers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. If anything, he took a part in the direct killing of Imam Hussein alayhi salam when Imam Hussein was lying down in the land of Karbala. It is said in some narrations that Shibith ibn Rabi was the one who stabbed Imam Hussein alayhi salam with a spear in his liver. Yes? If you were to look into the biography of Shibith ibn Rabi, you will realize that he was of that people on, that, were, that stood always in the middle, always fluctuated. Shibith ibn Rabi became Muslim. And then after the martyrdom of the Prophet وسلم, he became an apostate. And then he joined who? Sajah. Sajah was a woman in the Arabian Peninsula who claimed to be a messenger of Allah after the Prophet وسلم, uh, martyred. He was considered the mu'adhin of Sajah. He would recite the adhan. Could you imagine? You know, he left the religion of Islam. Then when he was captured, which miraculously I have no idea why he was saved and he was not punished. When he was captured, he did tawbah and he became Muslim again. 
Then he joined forces with the people that rebelled against the third Khalifa, Uthman. And then after that, he joined the forces of Al-Jamal against Imam Ali, alayhi salam, even though that they are the direct killers of Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa. Then after that, he did Tawbah. And then he went to Kufa. And then he joined the army of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, and Safin. He fought alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam. But then when the Khawarij split from the army of Imam Ali alayhi salam, he joined the Khawarij. Then after that, he left the Khawarij and did Tawbah. And then after that, what did he do? He joined the army of Yazid ibn Mu'awiyah on the land of Karbala. A persona that always fluctuates. Never taken aside. And this is why the religion of Islam always wants you to take a side and stick to it. And hopefully it's the side of Haqq. But if you want to attain happiness and absolute contentment in life, you need to choose a side. And therefore, you will notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted this incident in um, the masjid. An incident that might occur, might occur even in our uh, time and day. In every single community center or even a masjid. Isn't it? That you find some people don't want to sit with those type of people. Some people don't want to go to this markaz. Or some people don't want to visit this institution. Some people do not want to associate with other races. And so forth. And let's not get into the marja drama that, oh, mashallah, we love to speak about in the Ahlul Bayt school of thought. Isn't it? Because it's almost like a competition. Whose marja is more cool than the other? I, I don't understand why. Nevertheless, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights such incidents, even though that might be insignificant, but it gives it so much importance. And right away, after the verses that speak about the end of the story of the people of the cave, and it's almost like as if this is the nucleus. This is the outcome of the outcome. This is what you need to focus on, O Muhammad, after we just narrated to you the story of the people of the cave. And what I would like to do tonight is to further discuss the story of the people of the cave and inshallah explain more depending on the following points. The first one is that let's look into the cave in which the companions of the cave seek refuge in. We reached last night to a point where they almost arrived to the cave. And the second point, the way that they were put to sleep inside the cave. And the third, let us shed the light on the fear factor that the Quran highlights within the verses about the people of the cave. And fourth and final point, the awakening of the people of the cave, inshallah. And before I proceed, I would like you to provide me with a loud salawat. We got to a point where we said in verse number 16, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَإِذِ اَعْتَزَلْتُمُوهُمْ وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ فَأْوُوا إِلَى الْكَهْفِ يَنْشُرْ لَكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ مِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ وَيُهَيِّئْ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَمْرِكُمْ مِرْفَقَا This was verse number 16 in Surah the Cave. When we look into the verse number 16, it's almost as if the Quran is telling us right now that the companions of the cave gathered together and Allah inspired them. It's almost as if it's an inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for them to head towards the cave. Remember what we spoke in the beginning and the first two lectures. We spoke about the concept of dua and the conditions of having the dua accepted and even getting a result from your dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we were to focus on, on verse number 16 in Surah Al-Kahf, we would notice that it's the reply, it's the answer from Allah of the dua of the companions of the cave in, in verse number 10. What does verse number 10 say? إِذْ أَوَّلْ فِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ When the youth took refuge in the cave, فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا They supplicated in dua. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً They said, Our Lord, grant us a mercy from yourself. وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا And help us on to rectitude in our affair. In verse number 16, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَإِذْ اَعْتَزَلْتُمُهُمْ The first thing is that as soon as you disassociate yourself from who? From the mushrikeen. The concept of اعتزال. Disassociating yourself from the society that you live in, even though if this society has a lot of effect on you, even though that that society puts a lot of pressure on you, and that's a very hard examination that we are all put under, especially if you're Lebanese. Sometimes when you're Lebanese, the most, the most challenges that you will face in life is that being surrounded by family that sometimes want to implement certain things on you that might be haram, such as what? Music in our weddings, mashallah. It is something that is absolutely hard 
to try to implement. And you say, and sometimes you're put under pressure, is that you're invited to a wedding, you have friends and family that, that wanna play music. And obviously not in the Lebanese culture. There's many cultures that suffer from this regard, for instance. Is that this addiction to music in the weddings. Some people, mashallah, they become maraja and they give their own fatwas. They say, no, no, music is permissible only in the wedding. Well, what do you mean it's permissible only in the wedding? It's almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a small break in the wedding. It's okay. You can dance, you can do dabke and everything, and then after that, don't worry, he'll come back to life. It's absolutely hard to disassociate yourself. And that's why it is always the ones that are willing to take that step and take that challenge are the ones that are complemented in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Focus, as we said, as we put a, a rule when it came to those sessions, what did we say? We said the Quran explains Quran. If we were to open that same verse, when you have disassociated yourself from them, if you open Surah Maryam, the, the Surah right after Surah the Cave, didn't we say that one of the miraculous things about Surah the Cave, and one of the things that Surah the Cave is distinguished by, is that it comes in the middle between Surah Bani Israel, the Israelites, and Surah Maryam. And Surah the Israelites speaks about the future of the Israelites that shall come just a bit before the times of the reappearance of our awaited Imam. And Surah Maryam speaks about what? Speaks about Nabi Isa as being the savior, the one who was lifted up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and shall return back with who? With our awaited Imam Ajallah ta'ala Farah Sharif. So you make or you do the math yourself and understand that there's a combination between both. And that's why Surah the Cave is miraculous in how it indicates um, totally about Imam Al Zaman Ajallah ta'ala Farah Sharif if you were to focus on the subliminal messages in it. So you find in Surah 48 and 49 in Surah Maryam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَأَعْتَزِلُكُمْ وَمَا تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَأَدْعُوا رَبِّي عَسَىٰ أَلَّا أَكُونَ بِدْعَاءِ رَبِّ شَقِيَةِ I disassociate myself from you. And that's about Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because Nabi Ibrahim, very similar to the people of the cave, lived in a society that worshipped idols. So what did, he, what did he say? I decided to disassociate myself from you. Right? And then in Surah, four, uh, in verse number 49, فَلَمَّا اَعْتَزَلَهُمْ so when he had left them, when he dissociated with the, himself from them, وَمَا يَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ And what they worship besides God, just like exactly very similar to the verse. وَإِذَا اَتَزَلْتُمُوهُمْ مَا يَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And verse number 16 in Surah the Cave. Are you are following me here? Or am I speaking too fast? Because that is an issue that I suffer from. It's been 16 years on the Mumbai and I haven't changed on this. Lots of advice on that. And they say, when do the Lebanese genes kick in? We're just too stubborn people by nature. Anyways, nonetheless, we hate to change. And from what they worship except God, the same exact similarity in those verses, right? Is that you disassociate yourself, and then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam in verse number 49 in Surah Maryam, saying, Is that as soon as he disassociated himself from them, and what they worship besides God, this, We gave him Ishaq, and Yaqub, what does this tell me? It is almost as if, if I wanna achieve purity in life, I need to disassociate myself from people who are not focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to do this. And this is why in the hadith by Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam that he narrates from his father, Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, he tells him, Bunay Baqir, wa iyaka wa musahabat al-fasiq, fa innahu yabi'uka bi aklatin aw aqallu min dhalik. It says, oh my son Baqir, do not associate with a fasiq, an immoral person. A fasiq is a fiqh term of a person that breaks the laws of Allah. Do not associate yourself with a moral, with an immoral person, for he will sell you out for a morsel, a bite of food, or even less than that. A person that breaks the laws of Allah, even though claims to adopt the laws of Allah, adopt the religion of Islam, is a person that will never be loyal to you. He'll sell you out on the spot. And therefore he says what? Meaning that Allah is complimenting the companions of the cave that thought what? They took the decision to disassociate themselves totally from that society, from them and what they worship except God. And that is the answer to their dua in verse number 10. Because in verse number 10, what did they say? They say, they said, our Lord, grant us a mercy from you. That's what they said. Not only they disassociated themselves, they embarked on this journey towards Allah that shall happen in the cave, but they also wanted the mercy from yourself. Remember we explained that part when it comes from Ladun, the mercy from Allah's self, and help us to rectitude in our for Is that just, just prepare for us 
a rectitude from our affair? Here, the answer of the dua came. وَإِذَا تَزَلْتُمُهُمْ وَمَا عَبِدُونَ اللَّهِ فَأْوُوا إِلَى الْكَهْفِ يَنْشُرْ لَكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ مِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ They ask from a mercy from Allah, your Lord will unfold his mercy for you. What does this tell me? That a dua from a sound heart with absolute sincerity and a pure intention and for a godly cause, then definitely should be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no better time to take advantage of this and purify our hearts so they can reach to a level of being a sound heart and our sincerity, except in the month of Ramadan. Isn't it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered their dua on the spot. And he said, Yanshur lakum rabbukum He will unfold his mercy for And then on top of this, not only this, and he will help you to ease or, or on to ease in your affair just exactly like what they answered them this is the miraculous part in this surah and then the verse that should, the verse the verses that shall follow talk to us mainly about what was happening in the cave so here are the companions they gathered around under the banner of faith and then they seek refuge in a cave. Be it an inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many of the commentators of the Holy Quran indicate this meaning. That it was just a, an inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why the cave? And we explained before that how sometimes a place, even though cut off from the means of life, can be a lot better and more blessed than a place of luxury to live in. As long as you are able to perform your ibadah and keep and preserve your own deen and your own aqidah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, he explains to us, he draws to us this image, this beautiful image about what was really happening in the cave. So now they are in the cave, they were put to sleep. And then Allah says to the Prophet وَتَرَ الشَّمْسَ And this moves us to our second point, inside the cave. وَتَرَ الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ تَزَاوَرُ عَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينَ وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِضُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِنْ You may see the sun when it rises slanting toward the right of their cave. Simply why? You see, as many of you may know, that caves in general are narrow in the entrance. So they have a very narrow entrance. And the majority of the times, they almost like expand in space as soon as you approach the middle. Isn't it? So Allah is telling us here that after they were put in, into sleep, is that now he's explaining to us, is that how is it that they were kept in their sleep for th so many long years in this regard? So as the human body, you do need sunlight, no doubt. But you need just the right amount of sunlight. Not to be exposed totally to sunlight, and not less. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here is that the opening of the, of the cave, in fact, was facing north, right? So since the opening of the cave was facing north, the mountain which the cave was in is on the north side of the map of the earth. Hence, the sun, when it would rise, the sunlight did not enter directly to their cave. And that's what Allah says, tazawaru. Tazawaru comes from the word ziyara. Meaning when you visit someone, you don't stay for a very long time, isn't it? You visit someone and then you leave, right? The same thing with your ziyara, when you go to ziyara. It's almost like that's why you're called a za'ir, a musafir. You're just a traveler, you're just a guest. You're not a person who's living there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that it's almost like the sunlight is visiting them. Meaning it to wouldn't totally shine inside, but at the same time it would just shine and provide them with enough sunlight. And that's why he says, تَزَاوَرُ عَنْ كَافِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينَ So on the right side, وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِدُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ So and then, when it sets, cut across them towards the left. When the sun would rise from the side of the cave, it would side from the right side of the cave. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he's saying. And then when it would set, it would set from the north. And then Allah says, وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِنْ And that's why he said, وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِدُهُمْ غَرَبَتْ And when it sets, Allah uses the term تَقْرِدُهُمْ تَقْرِدُهُمْ in Arabic comes from the word قَرْد قَرْد is basically a loan, right? You remember when we spoke about getting a mortgage, right? So basically when you get a mortgage, you're basically getting a loan from the bank. And by the way, on a side note, it's really interesting how people race to get mortgages, right? So many people come to you and they say, oh, how come you don't own your house? 
It's almost like, how come you're not a slave to the bank? Like, how dare you not be a slave to the bank, isn't it? Right. The word mortgage, do you know where it comes from? It's actually a French word. It's not an English word. Um, and it consists, consists of two syllables. It's mort, gage. Mort in French is death. Gage is a pledge. So it's a law French term that was used in Britain during the Middle Ages, by the way. So you would go take a loan, and then in return, you would sign your death pledge, right? MashaAllah. And many of us raise to get mortgages nowadays. As in, you're signing your own death pledge. Clearly, it's very clear. It's not a conspiracy. It's just right there, right there in front of you. SubhanAllah. So Allah is saying it's almost like as if the sun is loaning them the light. It's just that barely shines on them a lot. Why? So their bodies would not burn from the sunlight. Allah went so specific to the point to tell us where exactly they were sleeping inside the cave because that's a very important scientific reality. Meaning they did not choose to sleep on the entrance of the cave, but fajwatin min. Meaning what? Whenever and they are in a cavern within it. So basically, there's a space that they chose, which was wide enough in order for them to sleep. And then the Quran moves on and saying what? ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ Who can remember what exactly we began the opening of the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf? Is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم When the people came to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked them about the people of the cave, you know, because that was the question that were given, that they were given from the Jews and the Christians to test the apostlehood. Is that how truthful is the message of the Prophet? When they came to the Prophet, what did they say? The reply came to him, uh, to, to the Prophet وسلم, saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Am hasibita anna ashab al-kahfi wa raqimi kanu min ayatina ajaba. Is that, do you consider that the people, do you suppose the companions of the cave and the inscription were among our wonderful signs? Here, in verse number 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, in verse number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And that is one of God's signs. And this is why we said that it's almost the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu in the beginning of the surah is that O oh, Muhammad do not consider that just generally the story of the people of the cave is one of our signs or one of our miraculous and wonderful signs. There are more wonderful signs even within the details of the story let alone in the Holy Quran in general of previous nations. And that's why Allah said ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ مَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدْ Whoever God guides is rightly guided. Why? Because they asked for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it? So Allah is telling me that whoever Allah wishes to guide or, or, or whoever Allah finds that they have the ability to, to acquire guidance, Allah shall guide. Man whoever guides is rightly guided. And whoever he leads astray, you will never find for him a friend who can guide. And then he used the term what? Murshida. The same exact dua that was said by the people of the cave when they said, lana min amrina rashada. Subhanallah, the sequence of the story of the people of the cave. And believe it or not, brothers and sisters, when I decided to dissect the narratives of the people of the cave, or Surah Al-Kahf in general, when I took the decision, I thought that the easiest part will be the story of the companions of the cave. Subhanallah. I thought that maybe the hardest one, will, inshallah, we'll get to, is the story of Nabi Musa alayhi salam and Al-Khidr alayhi salam. Because that's such a miraculous story. Fascinating story. But the more I dwelled into the verses of the companions of the people of the cave, the more I noticed so much, so much that we could dissect and understand. And let alone, and there's many points that I had to leave aside simply because of the time frame. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا يُدْلِدْ And whoever he leads astray, you will never find for him uh, never find for him a friend or any friend who can guide. And then he continues by describing to us, so first he described the cave, how they slept in the cave, the situation, even the direction of the sun and the sunlight and the sunset. And then it says what? On the other hand, by the way, since the opening of the cave was facing north, the, right, the type of winds that would blow into the cave were considered north winds. And north winds would blow, basically creating just the right temperature inside the cave in order for them to sleep. And this is also another miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says what? And then he describes the people of the cave. So it's almost like as if it's an imagery. You walk into the cave, 
And then you see those companions of the cave sleeping. You will suppose them to be awake, though they are asleep. And this, the commentators of the Holy Quran, and even historians, went to a lot of dispute when it comes to this. Meaning what? Meaning why do you suppose, to the, um, when you see them, you will suppose that they are awake, but in reality they were asleep. Some even suggested that they slept with their eyes open. Simply because if the eyes would shut down for a very long time, it would be very hard for it to practice sight. And Allah wanted to keep them so he can bring, bring them back again. Some suggest that. Some suggest that, no, even the way that they were sleeping is that you would think that they are awake with their bodies. Why? Because they slept with their arms wide open, spread wide. And therefore, just for them to be protected, from numerous things, meaning for example, if any ferocious animal would enter the cave, he would think that they are awake and therefore would not approach them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that you would think that they are awake, you know, but in reality, they are asleep. You would suppose that they are awake. And that's another miracle, and so many explanations have been given in this regard, but none are absolutely accurate as what does it really mean, and this is from the secrets, the hidden gems in the holy Quran, and maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to push our minds to even research more and find out more realities. And we turn them to the right and to the left, and that's simply for their blood circulation. We said earlier that arguably the amount of years that the companions of the cave slept was 309 years, isn't it? 300, I know people that in, the, in their dua, they say, well, Allah put me to sleep until the day of Eid, inshallah. Nevertheless, you find that 309 years they had to wait, right? So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was turning their bodies to the left and to the right. Meaning what? So that is also important for the blood circulation in their bodies because they could not sleep in the same spot. You find that people that, for example, may Allah forbid, enter the hospital, and they sleep for a very long time, or maybe in a coma, they become like a vegetable. They consider it like a, it's almost like condition like a vegetable, simply because their bodies are not moving. So they just stay in one spot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, no, that we transform them, we turn them around, we turn their bodies from the right to the left. And then here, all of a sudden, after Allah introduces for me, the companions of the cave, referring to them as youth, even the shepherd that accompanied them, all of a sudden I find that there's a new character that came in the picture, which is who? The dog, subhanAllah. And then he says what? And we turn them from the right to, uh, right to, right to the left. وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِطٌ ذِرَاعِيهِ بِالْوَصِيدِ And their dog lies stretching its four, four legs at the threshold of the cave. And if you come upon them, and then we'll get to that. See, subhanAllah, it's almost like as if there's a new character that Allah is introducing to the whole story. And on a side note, by the way, you see, there's a hadith attributed to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and where he says, Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. By the way, one of the nice things of uh, lecturing amongst different types of communities, you find that in the Indo-Pak community, so for example, the Pakistani community, the Khoja community, they have this beautiful habit and this beautiful trend that as soon as you mention a name of a masoom, they recite the salawat with the loudest of our voices. Imagine, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And subhanAllah, sometimes in one hadith, you have four different names of masumin. So all what you hear is salawat, and that's of course a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is wonderful, in fact. It's almost like as if to add the blessings, and that's a, such a beautiful habit. Um, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what here? وَكَلْبُهُمْ See, on a side note, you see, the religion of Islam does not hate dogs. See, many people come and say, oh, the religion of Islam, they hate dogs, that pushes, no, 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 the religion. There's a jurisprudential law when it comes to a dog. And that jurisprudential law states that a dog is ayinun najasa, meaning by itself it's najis. But in reality, it doesn't really hate dogs. There's a hadith attributed to Imam al-Sadiq where he says what? Where he says that there are three different animals that shall enter heaven. And one of them is the dog of the people of the cave. So who knows what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in terms of the day of qiyamah. Uh, things shall be transformed indeed. And then he says, وَكَلْبُهُمْ And their dog lies stretching in its four legs at the threshold. See here, Ayatollah Nasir Makarim in his book, Tafsir Al-Amthal, makes a beautiful point. He said, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduce the character, goes into details to mention even the dog? So what Allah is telling us here is that when a person embarks on a journey and puts his or her uh, footsteps 
on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking for guidance to be saved and save their aqidah and deen, Allah shall employ everything around them and every living thing around them, even when it comes to an animal or a stray dog should be, shall be subservient to their cause. And that's a really beautiful, nice ethical point to make in this regard. And then here comes the final point that we said, or the third point that we said, said the fear factor that Allah speaks about in the Holy Quran. Says what? لَوَطَّلَعْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ لَوَلَّيْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِرَارًا وَلَمُلِئْتَ مِنْهُمْ رُعْبًا if you, were, if you come upon them, you will surely turn to flee from them and you will be filled with terror of them. So there's a fear factor that Allah added to the people of the cave. Why? See, it could be for numerous reasons. One is that, does it really mean that they look scary by itself? It's like, imagine just walking into someone. You see, it, there's a really interesting question they say. Is that how many of us are willing to spend the night uh, with a dead body in the same room? See, many of us might fear to do so. Many of us would not even approach that room that has a dead body in it. When in reality, this person is dead. He's not going to do anything. Right? This person is not going to rise from the dead and scare you. But the fact is that what do we really fear? Do we fear that dead person in particular? Or no, we just fear the idea of death because we don't know what it is. And we don't know what shall happen after death. You get it? So that's why there is a fear factor in this regard. Another tafsir of this is what? Is that no, Allah provided them with the fear factor simply so the people that were chasing them because they were being chased by the officials, by the guards of the emperor, is that no, capture those people. They're government officials that run away. They escape from the emperor. Is that so as soon as they would approach them in the cave, they would be um, confronted with fear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes blesses mu'mineen with that fear factor, believe it or not. How many of us have seen someone that they have so much iman that we have this thing, it's almost like they have a prestige, they have this aura around them that we even fear or we, we can tend to have a lot of respect to even approach them. That we fear we kind of pick and choose our words on how to approach them in this regard. Focus on dua and nudba. In dua and nudba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَنَصَرْتَهُ بِالرَّعْبِ and you granted him victory about Imam al-Zaman al-Sharif. You granted him victory with what? With the fear factor. And this is in the tafsir, in the hadith, by the imams when they speak about the times of the reappearance of our awaited imam, they say that the imam will walk and fear will be walking right in front of him. That's his enemies with fear. And that fear factor, subhanAllah, we've, we're even seeing it not right now in Gaza, isn't it? You find that the Israeli soldiers, mashallah, they're the perfect example of keyboard heroes. Keyboard heroes, all what they know what to do is just sit behind a keyboard and press a button and kill people. Children, but then come to the battlefield, know that there's a fear factor. Wahad, fear factor of Iman. Because these people that are fighting are rooted in Iman. They're fighting for something that they believe in. Right? That's why they're willing to die for the cause. So the fear factor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people of the cave in this regard. It says, لَوُدْتَلَاتَ عَلَيْهِمْ That if you were to see them, that if you, come up, uh, come, uh, if you come upon them, you will surely turn to flee from them. So it's almost like that, is, that and will be filled with terror of them. And this moves us on to the final point of our discussion tonight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ And then now he's talking about ba'ath. Here, there's a long discussion in this regard. Inshallah, I will leave to that uh, final night when we talk about the closing of the story of the people of the cave. But on a side note, note here that in surah number, uh, in verse number 19, Allah says, Right? So, so it was that we aroused them from sleep so that they may question one another. If we go back to verse number 12 in surah the cave, what did we say? When Allah introduced the story of the people of the cave in general, he said what? Then we aroused them that we, that, that we might know which of the two groups better reckoned the period that they had stayed. Here, in verse number 19, the same thing. It says that after I went into the details of the, so their story, they were put to sleep, and now it says, وَكَذَلِكَ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ Ba'ath, and that's a really good question, is that Ba'ath name mainly, is that when a person is aroused, it's mainly from death, right? But then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also saying the same thing, using the same example as 
when, when a per, about the people of the cave that since they were put to sleep. If I were to open Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 259, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a person. Or him who came upon a township as it lay desolate. There was a ruins. Allah speaks about a person. That person is Nabi Uzair. Or in the Old Testament, Azra. Prophet Azra, he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he was passing by a town, and that town was in ruins. So he questioned in his mind. He said, how will God revive this after its death? Meaning this is do it, uh, is in ruins. Allah says, فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ مِئَةَ So God made him die for a hundred years. And then he says here, ثُمَّ بَعَثَهُ He then resurrected him. Right? And then he says, قَالَ كَمْ لَبِثْتَ He asked him, how long did you remain? He said, قَالَ لَبِثْتُ يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمًا is that I stayed, I remained. So he said, I have remained a day or a part of the day. If we go back to Surah the Cave, subhanAllah, the same exact expression was used by the companions of the cave. They said, we have stayed for a day or a part of the day. And this is where I will end tonight. And inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow. And I will end with the following dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kun li al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا معينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين